in Professor Richard Jones. He's an experimental physicist studying uh, subconscious matter, such as properties of molecules near interfaces. Uh, he's the professor of materials physics and innovation policy at the University of Manchester. Uh, he has also uh, he has a wider interest in science and innovation policy, such as the effects of uh, innovation on productivity growth. He has also won the, the medals such as uh, Tabo Medal at the Institute of Physics for his contribution to nanoscience. And you might also know him from some of his textbooks if you take self-condensed matter. And today he's here to talk about uh, self, sorry, from self-stratifying films to uh, sorry. Yeah, to leveling up. I rather walk in polymer physics and science policy. Welcome. Great, thank you very much. Right, well, thank you for, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come to Cambridge and uh, for reasons that you'll see, I know the city quite well. I'm just going to start with a few words about me. Just to, uh, This is really just an excuse to, to dig out some old photographs of me. But, so currently I'm a professor and vice president at the University of Manchester. I've only been there since 2020, so that's been quite a recent uh, thing. I spent a long time at Sheffield University as the professor of physics in Sheffield. Uh, but before that, I was a lecturer in the Cambridge Laboratory, and I'm very pleased with this old picture. There's me looking much younger with uh, Ruth Cameron, who's now Professor of Material Science, and uh, Adrian uh, Rennie and uh, Athene Donald, who, of course, is now Professor Dame Athene Donald. Uh, I was a postdoc in uh, Cornell University for a couple of years, 87 to 89. Did my PhD. You can see I was looking even more disreputable by in 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 between 1983 and 1987. Very poor taste in knitwear. Uh, and I was a student. I did physics, natural sciences between 1980 and 1983. And so there's a picture of me in an attempt to persuade you that physics students can know about more than physics. We got knocked out in the quarterfinal by Bristol, if I remember rightly. I want to tell you about today. It is a bit of a mixture. I thought rather than just talking about a straight bit of uh, science, I'd tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things that I've been interested in my research career. So it's really about polymer physics and particularly thin films and interfaces and what goes on in those things. But I want to tell you a little bit about my work on the relationship between science and society and some surprising relationships I think there are about the way that people think about science and how that affects uh, public attitudes to science. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about innovation policy and uh, how, uh, uh, and I think it is important, I think more scientists ought to get involved in talking about policy, talking to governments, trying to persuade governments to do the right thing. So I'll say a little bit about how I've managed to do that to, to the extent that I have. Uh, but I want to start with a question, just a very straightforward question. What drives macromolecules to move? And I'm going to start slightly whimsically with one of my favourite books. This is one of my favourite books. It's a novel by the Irish writer, Fan O'Brien, third policeman. He wrote it about in about the 30s, I think. It's a very funny book. And if you've never read anything by Fan O'Brien, you should. It's very funny, very poignant, and actually rather tragic when you actually work out what the book's about. But anyway, it features a, a policeman, the third policeman, and his relationship with his bicycle. That's a major theme. And uh, there are lots of asides about science in this book. And he, the, the policeman talks about the atomic theory. Did you ever discover or hear tell of the atomic theory, the sergeant inquired? Everything is composed of small molecules of itself and they're flying around, never standing still or resting, but spinning away and darting hither and thither and back again all the time on the go. These diminutive gentlemen are called atoms. Okay, so he took this further. The gross and net result of it is that people who spend most of their natural lives riding iron bicycles over the rocky roadsteads of this parish get their personalities mixed up with the personalities of their bicycle as a result of the interchanging of the atoms of each of them. And you'd be surprised at the number of people in these parts who are nearly half people in half bicycles. So I think a, a, a very important lesson for people who live in Cambridge. I'm glad I escaped uh, uh, young enough before this terrible fate overcame me. 
But it kind of prompts this, you know, obviously absurd, an absurd idea that the, 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 the kinetic theory of uh, of matter would mean that, uh, you know, you you turn into a bicycle and your, your bicycle turns into you. But like many absurd ideas, it's actually quite interesting. To say, okay, why, just why is that so stupid? Uh, and so why don't riders merge with their bicycles? Okay, this is about how fast can molecules move around. It's about molecular mobility, but it's about what are the driving forces for molecular diffusion? And uh, diffusion, you're enormously familiar with. I, I mean, this is the process that, uh, that, that, you know, the kinetic theory of molecules does tell you that in a, in a liquid, the molecules are all moving around. If I drip, drop some dye into a liquid, you'll see the dye mixes with the, the, the water. The water becomes a uniform shade of blue. And so that's uh, you know an enormously familiar phenomenon, uh, and uh, you know what you learn if you when you first learn about diffusion, you learn this is about equalizing concentration gradients. But actually, what it's really about is maximizing the entropy of the universe. This is a kind of typical non-equilibrium second law phenomenon where uh, uh, you start out with a low entropy state, you end up with a high entropy state. And that's why, you know, ultimately that's the driving force. That's what goes on. So when you, when, when you learn about diffusion, you think about a concentration gradient, you think about molecules flowing down the concentration gradient, and uh, you, you, you learn Fick's law, which tells you that the, the flux of, of molecules is just given by the concentration gradient. So the steeper the concentration gradient, the faster they go. But in fact, really, if you were thinking about this more fundamentally, you'd actually say it's not the, it's not the concentration that matters, it's the chemical potential, because the chemical potential is the free energy per molecule. And what you learn in, uh, in, in, in statistical mechanics is that maximizing the entropy of the universe is achieved uh, in uh, typical laboratory conditions by uh, uh, minimizing the free energy. So, so it's the chemical potential that actually drives molecules to flow down because that reduces the, 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 the free energy. And the chemical potential is related to the derivative of the free energy with respect to concentration. Okay, what's all this mean? Mostly, it means that everything's more or less the same. Uh, if the entropy of mixing was all that mattered, none of this would make any difference. And the, the, the object of uh, maximizing the entropy of the universe, minimizing the free energy would be achieved by getting all the chemical potential gradients to the same. It's two special cases. One is sometimes if you have very favorable interactions between strongly emissible polymers, and this only works for polymers for reasons that I'll show, show in a minute, you can get very high diffusion, which is driven not by entropy, but by enthalpy. It's by the fact that the molecules actually positively want to mix. But more interestingly, if the, if the unfavorable interactions, if you have unfavorable interactions, you can get diffusion that goes backwards. So you can get things that diffuse from low concentration to high concentration. And that turns out to be interesting and important. So uh, uh, very fast diffusion can be driven by enthalpy. I just put this in mostly because it's what I did in my PhD. Uh, what, why this works for polymers is because there's a factor of N. Polymers don't like to mix because they're very big molecules. And so you don't get a lot of entropy when you mix them. Uh, so in, in those cases, even a very small degree of interaction from enthalpy can overcome that and make them want to mix faster. But more usually, you get this rather interesting thing. If you have an interaction between the two polymer molecules that's unfavorable, then uh, the diffusion coefficient actually turns negative. So the chemical potential gradient and the concentration gradient have opposite signs. And what happens is a flow of down a chemical potential gradient actually corresponds to molecules going from low concentration to high concentration. So what, why is that interesting and important? It's because it leads to the phenomenon of phase separation. This is why polymers or where any kind of liquids don't like to, uh, will, will phase separate. So if you mix up oil and water, if you manage to mix up, oil and water don't like to mix. 
Uh, if you manage to get them into the state, say you heat it up, if, they, if, you, if you manage to heat them so that they were able to mix, then you reduce the temperature so the mixture goes unstable. What happens is the thing phase separates. You get material going from low concentration to high concentration, and you get a phenomenon where any fluctuation in concentration is magnified, because any time there's a little bit of a fluctuation in concentration, that gets magnified and you get uh, two different phases appearing. And there's a, a very elegant mechanism which selects a length scale, which means that you get a single wavelength, uh, a single wavelength dominates the pattern. So, and this is just a, a kind of one of these typical balancing things. If you had a very small concentration, if you have very, uh, uh, if the fluctuations have a very small wavelength, then that will lead to lots of interface. That's got a high energy, so that doesn't uh, that those ones are suppressed. If it's a very long wavelength fluctuation, it just takes a long time for the molecules to go from the bottom to the top, as it were. So there's always a just right. Uh, there's there's a, a length scale selection mechanism that gives you a characteristic length scale. So that that's a, a bit of basic soft condensed matter physics that, that uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff is described in all good textbooks. What I want to talk about now is what happens if you've got a thin film. And it turns out in a thin film, particularly for macromolecules, the, the effect of the surface or indeed the interface can be really important. And this is what leads to this idea of layer of films that, that, that form uh, separate layers. First of all, these surface and interface effects are very important in polymers. And, uh, and this is, again, a, a strange feature of polymers. If I take any mixture, if I take any mixture of things that want to mix, you'll always find the surface will have the lower surface energy material at that surface because that lowers the system's energy. So if I take, for example, if you take a glass of gin, something that's like 40% alcohol, 60% uh, water, the very surface of that will be almost all alcohol because alcohol has a lower surface energy. But that's not, a, it's, that, you know, that, that, that's, um, it's not a hugely important effect because the, the, the length scale of that, that segregation is very small. But uh, uh, this curious feature of polymers is that because the polymer molecules are very long, their entropy of mixing is very small, as I mentioned. So even tiny, tiny differences in surface energy can, can, can create a big difference. And this is illustrated in a piece of work that, again from long ago, but even the difference between a hydrogenated polymer and a deuterated polymer is enough to, to, to drive this surface segregation. So some of you, no, you're probably not. It used to be said that, oh, the only, uh, the, the only isotopic system that phase separated because of its isotopes was helium-3 and helium-4. It's not in fact true. These pol polymers will do it on the basis between uh, a CH bond and a CD bond. Just because the zero point energy of the bond means that the, polariz the polarizability of the CH and the CD bond is slightly different. And that's enough to, to, to make the deuterated material have a lower surface energy. Anyway, that just illustrates how important this phenomenon is. And what this does, if we combine this with this idea that the diffusion coefficient can go negative, if I've got two materials that don't want to, that, that, that want to phase separate, and again, actually, in this case, this was just simply deuterated and hydrogenated, so it's that isotopic difference, what you can see is shown here. These are volume fractions through a thin film so you start out, what happens is near the surface, the lower surface energy goes to the surface. It makes a bit of a hole underneath it. So we've got low concentration. And now this whole thing of diffusion going backwards comes into play. So material diffuses out of the hole backwards and forwards and makes this essentially a concentration wave that propagates in from the surface. So that's uh, shown in this computer simulation here, which shows this effect uh, and, and so, you can get this layering effect. Well, why is this interesting? Well, who knows? Uh, why it's interesting is there are a lot of times when you actually want to look at a thin film and, uh, and see what's happening in there. You make a thin film for some functional reason, 
and I'll talk about uh, photovoltaics in a minute, and you want to see how that surface affects these separation processes. So just a very simple case, you could just spin, spin, spin a film and it will just separate into three layers. So this is what I call self stratification. Uh, so uh, the, the, the surface effects that in this, this phase separation can be driven in this case, just by the solvent being, being removed. So what's going on here is you're just taking a mixture of two polymers in a solvent, you spread it out on a surface. So you make maybe a 10 micron uh, layer of, uh, of material and it just spontaneously layers. So, so you just get the, these two, uh, the, in this case, a, a three layer system. So why this was interesting is, uh, I guess in the 90s, in, in the Cavendish, so Richard Friend and uh, uh, was studying uh, photovoltaics, Henning Siringhouse was studying uh, uh, field effect transistors made out of polymers, and uh, both of them, in, in Richard's case, it was his graduate student, Anna Arias, who discovered this. This phenomenon takes place in these semiconducting polymers. And so it, it offers a way of making devices in a single step without having to do anything complicated to make separate layers. So uh, I was interested in how this might work. So I wanted to see what's going on. So uh, what, what we did was built a piece of equipment that would allow us to study the formation of these films actually as you, uh, as you make them. So what you do in, in all kinds of areas where you want to make a thin polymer film, so if you're making photoresists to, 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 to do lithography, if you're making a, a thin film of semiconducting polymers to make a, a, a light emitting diode or a field effect uh, transistor or a photovoltaic, a very classic way of making a thin film is called spin coating. So you just have a little wheel that whirls around, you just plodge the uh, solution on the top, the, uh, the, the, the solution is spun off and a very thin uniform layer is left. And then you can see what happens uh, and then you, you get a very, very uniform, smooth film. So this is uh, a very, very common technique in all kinds of any kind of thin film experimentation with polymers. So what this system is, is just a little device that allows you to do that. But while it's doing it, you, you, you bounce a laser off it. So you just do light scattering to see what's happening. And so my postdoc, uh, uh, Sasha Herriot at the time, uh, worked out you could use this to see what's going on in this process. So what this plot shows, this is essentially showing the scattering out of the uh, the, the, the plane of the, re the reflection from the film. So that this this the, so, so it's the the scattering it's, it's in effect the scattering angle is along the x-axis. Along the y-axis is time, and it's a it's a contour plot just showing the uh, the, the intensity. So the big red thing on the left-hand side, that's just the specular reflection. That's just the light that's being reflected off the surface. So what you see are, are a number of things going on. You see, first of all, there's a big red blob that appears after about three seconds. That red blob is essentially a diffraction peak. It's a very broad diffraction peak, but it's telling you that some lateral structure is appearing uh, at, at, with a given wavelength. You can also see those that, that those red lines. What are those red lines? Those red lines are essentially fringes. They're fringes from as the film thins, reflections from the top and bottom surface are coming in and out of phase, and uh, that, 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 that's modulating the intensity. So you can interpret these, this data to see quite a lot of what's happening in the system as it goes on. And so what you actually find out is that you get a reduction in, uh, uh, the, you see these fringes, more detailed analysis tells you that the visibility of the fringes is modulated, which means that the thing has split up into two layers. And then the two layers, then, um, uh, uh, then they break up, then you get a, a, an instability at that interface. So you get these two layers, then there's an instability at the, the interface. And then this then breaks up laterally to form this, this, this lateral structure that you see here. And actually, if you the, the physics behind the instability is quite complicated and not fully understood, I think it's 
I, I believe it's what's known in the trade as a Marangoni instability, which comes about from having gradients of, uh, of surface and of interfacial energy. But what we hypothesized was if, if we understood the mechanism, which we sort of thought we did, uh, we could convince ourselves that we could control this instability by ch changing the rate at which the solvent evaporated. So uh, uh, Pav Pavane Makarian, my student at the time, now a, now, now a professor in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, she was able to show that you could turn the instability on and off by increasing the vapor pressure. So why we're interested in this? We're interested in it because uh, um, solar cells, we were interested in at the time because organic solar cells uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be made from, from, from polymer blends. So this is a very, you know, the very early discovery of uh, organic solar cells. Again, it was made in the Cavendish by Richard Friend's group. And the, 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 they were able to show back in 1996 that you could make a solar cell from two polymers. Uh, one was a, a, an electron donor, one was an electron acceptor. Now, the interesting thing about solar cell, why polymer solar cells are different to silicon solar cells is because the binding energy of the exciton that is formed is much higher for a polymer than it is for silicon. So a photon comes in, makes an electron hole pair. In these polymer systems, the electron hole pair is quite tightly bound. It's quite hard to get the electron and hole apart. So uh, obviously it doesn't work as a solar cell unless you can get the, the, the electron and the hole apart of one to the, the anode and one to the cathode, then to kind of get a current to flow. And it turns out the way that the best way to do this is to have an interface. So if you have an interface between these two polymers, one's an electron donor, one's an electron acceptor, then that, that will then split the, 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 um, the, the, the exciton and you'll get, the, um, uh, you'll get some current flow. The snag is the exciton doesn't actually go that far. The exciton will diffuse about seven nanometers. So what this means is to get this, this, this thing to work with any kind of decent efficiency, you need to get every, you know, within seven nanometers of any, um, uh, anywhere in the system, you need to have an interface that the, the, the exciton could get to and then be split. So that says you've got to make, you got to think about the morphology here. You've got to have quite a complicated con degree of control over the morphology. And of course, there's lots more going on. It, there's much more than just the interface. There's the question of what the molecular ordering is, what the orientation is. Uh, th there's some subtleties about the injection layer, getting dopant grades, all kinds of stuff going on in these systems. But I just want to focus on this, uh, th th this, this, this balance between interface structure and, uh, and, and um, the, the, the instability of that interface. So, but the point I want to make really is just, you, you know, the idea is you want to make these things in really large quantities. So understanding this relationship between processing and morphology and performance is what you need to do to be able to optimize the, uh, the, 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 um, the performance of these things and hopefully make them uh, 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 useful. So you want to find the best processing route to optimize performance. Now, I want to kind of now interject a bit of the real world here. Okay, so uh, when I was doing this stuff, maybe 10 years ago, this is what I would say about it. And I, this is, in fact, I pinched the slide from one of those talks, so this is exactly what I did. I would say, you know why are we? Why do we think organic solar cells will replace silicon? Because it's possible to have a very cheap, high volume manufacturing process. So I imagined, you know, silicon solar cells, expensive batch, batch processing. At that time, the world output of silicon solar cells was about a few square kilometers. And so, you know, you'd want to have something a look more like a printing works, where you printed the stuff out in hundreds of square kilometers. So that's what I said but I was wrong. <laughs> and it's quite a cautionary tale here. Why was I wrong? Because the, 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 the cost of silicon solar cells uh, has dramatically fallen. It's exponentially fallen. And it follows this rather 
amazing relationship. So this is what people in the trade call a learning curve. This says, as you make more of anything, you get better at doing it and it gets cheaper and you can make more of it. So what you see on this curve is, uh, on, on the x-axis, this is the, you know, how much solar PV had been installed in total. And on the y-axis, the price in dollars on a logarithmic scale. So it's a log-log plot. So, so th this, th this has this characteristic log-log dependence. So this, is, this isn't physics anymore. This is innovation theory or, or economics or something. But there's something really interesting about this relationship, that, it, that, that, that it's a power law relationship. So you can see that between uh, 2011, well, say between 2005 and 2012, there was a factor of 10 increase in, in, uh, in, in how much photovoltaics has been made uh, and the, uh, the, 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 the price had dropped by a factor of five. So this is a, you know, an exponential relationship. So at this point, we can say all oh, that's, you know, it was a nice idea to think about organic solar cells. It's nice physics, it all works, but it's not going to be the thing that commercially drives the transition. So the, the lesson here is, you know, if you've got an incumbent technology, just the incremental innovation, just doing things a little bit better as you learn how to do it is enormously powerful. So, you know, that's a kind of really important lesson if you... But I, I'm, I hope many of you will go off and develop marvelous new technologies that you would like to replace the existing technologies. This is a cautionary tale. So can we improve the efficiency of silicon solar cells? If you can't beat them, can you join them? Let's just take silicon and say, what can we do with this? So the maximum efficiency of silicon solar cells is about 29%. It's a thing called the shockley chrysler limit. And the reason this happens is because uh, there's a solar spectrum. So what comes in from the sun looks something like that. It's, uh, uh, so, so it's peaked at about 600 nanometers, you know, a big thing into the infrared, a few chunks taken out by absorption in the atmosphere. But that, you know, that, that is the spectrum of sunshine as it lands on the Earth's surface. Now, the point about any, in fact, any uh, single junction uh, semiconductor fault of Ertaic is that the how well it works is given by its band gap. So the band gap of the silicon corresponds to a little bit more than a thousand. Silicon is transparent in the infrared. So uh, any infrared light that comes in is not absorbed by a silicon solar cell. But it's not much better on the blue side because actually uh, 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 on the blue side, the, uh, the, the light's absorbed, but it, um, uh, the, 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 the electron you promote into the valence band will just drop down to the band, to, 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 to the, uh, the, the top of that band, the top of the band gap, uh, and that energy will be lost just as heat. So the only place that a silicon solar cell can approach uh, full efficiency is exactly for energies at the band gap. And this is what means that you can't, uh, you, you can't exceed this limit. 29% is as high as a silicon solar cell can ever go. But if you had a scheme for efficiently converting blue light to red light, you could break that limit and you could increase the efficiency to something like 35%. So how, how can you do that? Well, uh, uh, the concept for doing this uh, was uh, thought up indeed in the Cavendish by Richard Friend and Akshay Rao, who uh, uh, is a, um, a young lecturer now, I think he's just been made a lecturer. And he had this, between them, they came up with this rather brilliant scheme. If you imagine an organic semiconductor, so it's a bunch of benzene rings stuck together, basically. If you get a blue photon, it comes in, it's absorbed, it makes a, an electron hole pair, and uh, um, this will be a singlet. So, so let, let the, the, the electron hole will have opposite spins. Now, due to some subtleties that can happen in these organic semiconductors, uh, these, the, these singlets can, in, in the right material, they can split, and they will split into two triplet excitons that each has half the energy. And 
Uh, why this is an interesting thing is because those the, these selection rules, well, that enormously complicated bit of atomic physics that I'm sure you know and love, through those selection rules, uh, that a triplet can't decay radiatively. So it can't, that, that, those, that, 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 that those can't, uh, that, the, 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 the high energy uh, the, uh, electron can't drop back down to the, to, uh, to the valence band uh, and emit its light because that, that, that's forbidden by the selection rules. So what happens is generally nothing. If you just sit it there, nothing will happen. Eventually, they will find a non-radiative way of decaying. The energy will be wasted or turn into heat. But the concept that Akshay came up with was if you have an inorganic semiconductor nanoparticle, uh, otherwise known as a quantum dot, um, if you match the band gap to the triplet excitons, then uh, the, the excitons can hop across. These triplet excitons can hop across into the quantum dot. You could control the band gap of the quantum dot precisely by changing its size, because the band gap is uh, very given by its size. And then the thing will kick out two red photons, each with half the energy. So this is a marvelous scheme that, in principle, every step in this is 100% efficient. So this ought to work. Of course, there's lots of stuff to worry about. And uh, you, you know, actually making it in practice, it's again, what's the morphology you can get? This is a kind of this is a cartoon that we drew to try and uh, illustrate all the complications of what you'd need to do to design a system that did this. And uh, in, in quite a big collaboration uh, that involves Hugo Bronstein in Cambridge, Akshay and Richard in Cambridge, Akshay and Neil in Cambridge, um, my Sheffield colleagues, Tony Ryan, Dan Toulon, Mike Weir, and myself, uh, with Cambridge Photon Technology trying to commercialize this, we've been working on, on trying to work out how to make this all work. There's a lot going on here. One of the things that happens is the quantum dots aggregate and the organic semiconductor crystallizes. Uh, uh, the semiconductor crystallizing is good, but the, the quantum dots aggregating isn't because that means, you know, instead of being dispersed, what you want to do is to have a quantum dot, you know, no more than a few, uh, a few, few nanometers away from every possible place where an exciton can be formed. So there's lots going on in this processing, and we're trying to understand that at the moment. And one of the things that we're trying to do, going back to what I showed you before about those light, we're trying to use in situ X-ray scattering to study the morphology of that as it happens. So, so we're doing this in a synchrotron, doing this in, in, in diamond. And what you can see, this is just some cartoons of the different mechanisms we're starting to see about how the, the, the quantum dots and the organic semiconductor interacts and how the crystallization of one drives the aggregation of the other. So what we hope is by understanding this process of morphology formation, we'll be able to work out a way of making these things practically. Well, I mentioned nanoparticles. I want to change gear now to talk about some of these policy, policy uh, uh, issues. I started thinking about nanoparticles in about 2003. And in 2004, Here's uh, um, the Prince of Wales uh, may have started a bit of a fuss about nanotechnology. He warred against the new thalidomide disaster. Uh, so I got very involved in public engagement about nanotechnology. So talking particularly to, uh, to people like Greenpeace, talking to uh, the, the kinds of organizations that in the past have not always been entirely in favor of new technologies, trying to understand, okay, what is it that people uh, might think is good about new technologies. What are people worried about new technologies? So that uh, that, well, that was uh, something that, that that took a lot of my time in in, in the two thousands. And uh, I, I wrote a book which really uh, made the argument that nanotechnology should be more like biology than engineering. And this was really a response to at the time there was uh, a lot of problems given to a, 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 a guy called Eric Drexler, who had this idea that nanotechnology would be like, as he described it, the principles of mechanical engineering applied to chemistry. And uh, my argument was that, uh, well, yes, biology is really interesting because it tells us about uh, you know, nanoscale machines and devices, but um, nanotechnology, you know, this kind of vision of nanotechnology as engineering shrunk down didn't take account of the fact that physics looks a bit different at the nanoscale. 
And I can't resist mentioning this film. So Raquel Welsh died a few days ago. One of the great films that Raquel Welsh was in in the 60s was Fantastic Voyage, a, a, a marvellous film which in which a, a, a top scientist has been threatened with, a, is about to have a stroke or something terrible is happening, and a bunch of um, top surgeons are shrunk down to nanoscale size and put into a submarine that goes through someone's bloodstream. Again, a marvellous, marvellous film that's all total rubbish. But like many things that are total rubbish, it's always interesting to say, why is this total rubbish? This film, I, I mean, I, I think this film was important in cultural history because, you know, if you look at uh, lots of um, illustrations of what people look, think nanotechnology will look like, you get all kinds of pictures like that. This is a picture that I was in some encyclopedia of, you know, some putative device that's kind of, uh, chiseling away deposits from the inside of of of, of, um, uh, of blood vessels. Uh, th th there's a, 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 an object which is uh, attempting to inject in a, a red blood cell. So these are you know artists' visions of what nanotechnology might look like. And this is, I think, the the, the fantastic one: a, a fertility enhancement device put by putting a rocket pack on the back of a sperm. Anyway, these are all obviously rubbish. But uh, it's all it's always interesting to say, oh, yes, I should say. Uh, and in fact, nano submarine idea is actually older than that. It actually um, the first, I believe, uh, statement of, nano, uh, of this idea of a nano submarine was in a book by Robert Heinlein, published in 1942, called Waldo. Uh, and there's a really interesting story there which links together the Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, the Satanist Alistair Crowley, and a mad rocket pioneer called Jack Parsons. But I haven't got time to tell you that, so I will move on. Did they get the science right? Of course they didn't get the science wrong. It's obviously rubbish, but it's interesting to ask why is it why it's wrong. And it's wrong for this reason, that physics is different when you're small. So uh, the viscosity is really important. You've got constant Brownian motion. You've got strong surface forces sticking everything together. Uh, and, you know, anytime you put anything into the blood, anybody who does anything medical will know any device you put into, into blood just gets coated with proteins as soon as it sees it. Just the proteins stick to it like anything. And, you know, this thing about low Reynolds numbers, really important. There's this great paper by uh, Ed Purcell called Life at Low Reynolds Numbers, which makes this point so well. Reynolds number tells you it's essentially the ratio. If I imagine if, if you go swimming and you want to go forward, what's stopping you move forward? Two things stop you. One is the fact that water has inertia. And so you have to move the water out of the way to make progress. The other thing is that water's got viscosity. And the Reynolds number is essentially just the ratio of those two things. It's the ratio of the inertial force to the viscous force. So if you go swimming, the world we see when you're swimming is high Reynolds number. So inertia dominates when you shrink things down because the Reynolds number has got a size in it. Uh, if you are a bacteria if, or if you're a nano submarine, uh, viscosity would be dominant. And in fact, you, you know, it would feel to you if you were shrunk down to, to, to make a, a fantastic voyage submarine, uh, it would feel like you were swimming in the thickest, thickest treacle. And that's got really interesting consequences. Uh, one of the consequences it's got is that um, low Reynolds number fluid mechanics is actually time reversible. So anything that you do, if you do that stroke, then you do that stroke, all the progress you make forward, you lose by going backwards. Uh, so, so you have to, whatever you do, you have to break time reversal symmetry to make any progress. So I'd spent a, a, a bit of time thinking about this. So I think about, well, how could I make a, sub, a, a nano submarine that would work? And my problem was solved by a brilliant theoretical physicist called Ramin Golastanian, who was a colleague of mine at uh, Sheffield at the time. He's now in Max Planck Institute. And he's, as I say, one of the smartest physicists I know. And he came up with this brilliant idea. He just said, okay, if I take a particle, I half coat it with a catalyst. And then I shove this into a, a, a solution and I've got some chemical species that's catalyzed. It doesn't really matter what it is, but if the, the reaction produces more products than it has reactants, then what happens is that on one side, you get a higher concentration of stuff. 
And what this means is that it generates its own osmotic pressure gradient. So this is a particle that sits and it's pushed along by its own osmotic pressure gradient. Uh, so it's a brilliantly simple idea. And my uh, postdoc at the time, John Howes, who's now a professor in, in, in Sheffield, managed to get this to work. So, so the simple uh, reaction we used was just to take a polystyrene sphere, half coat it with platinum, the platinum catalyzes uh, the, the reaction we use, which is simply hydrogen peroxide. Uh, it's just split by this, uh, it's catalyzed by platinum. So it's all quite straightforward. So here's a, a set of videos that show this at work. So what we've got here on the left hand, so top left, I've got no, no fuel, no catalyst, just jiggling around, just here it's random, it's browning in motion. Bottom left, it's got catalyst, but no fuel, jiggling around, just doing its brownian in motion. Top right, fuel, no catalyst, just doing brownian in motion. Bottom right, fuel and catalyst. And you can see it's, it's zipping around quite, quite fast. So this all works. And you can, you can just part, track the particles uh, and you can see they, they're, 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 quite, they're quite different. So, um, anyway, that's telling me it's nearly time. Uh, uh, and there's uh, Raman has a nice theory of it, so you can uh, you, you can uh, uh, check check out the theory. So that was a, that that is a little um, segment about why watching trashy science fiction films can often be quite helpful. I want to finish in my last ten minutes by talking about innovation. And I've talked about innovation a little bit, talking about solar cells. I just want to point out that at the moment, there are two things that people say about innovation. Uh, if you get people like Ray Kurzweil, he says the rate of technological innovation is accelerating, you know, and uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil says that there's going to be a singularity when we're all uploaded to our iPhones and uh, uh, everything uh, changes forever. And he says it's going to happen in 2045. But on the other hand, you get economists like Tyler Cowen, Robert Gordon, are actually saying, well, okay, technological innovation is slowing down, and the pace of innovation is insufficient to save us from what economists call secular stagnation. So, and I just point out, we are in a kind of paradoxical world at the moment because you know you look you look at science and you look at you know cool things that are happening in science, you know, mRNA vaccines, you know, quantum computing looking like it's about to happen. Uh, you know, deep learning producing fantastic, uh, uh, you know, machine learning results. Uh, so you've got this, this sense of fantastic advances. But on the other hand, if I look at the, the raw economics numbers, it doesn't look good. This is, uh, uh, you know, the economic data. So uh, this, this shows uh, product, UK productivity. So this is what economists measure as how much output you produce per hour of work. So, uh, you know, between 1970 and 2008, uh, um, this is again, it's a, a, a semi log plot. So it's showing exponential growth. So, actually, you know, the economy or how good we were at, at making value from our labor improved at two and a bit percent a year annually from, in fact, before 1970. R really steady progress. And then in 2008, we had this global financial crisis, and that just seems to have stopped. Now, the UK, I, I mean, you can, this is for the UK. This is a problem that's worse in the UK than anywhere else, but actually everywhere looks a little bit similar. So the same slowdown is, is seen everywhere. So uh, what, what, where, where, what could we ascribe this to? I mean, one of the issues, of course, is in the UK. Uh, you know, as scientists, we'd expect um there to be a relationship between how much effort we put into research and development how many new technologies we produce and how uh, and how that then translates into uh, into economic growth and so you know you could very well point to the fact that in the uk the research intensity of the economy that's how much effort the economy devotes to research and development that's fallen from uh, 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 from a bit more than two to, to, to a bit percent in 1980. It, it, it's fallen over the years. Uh, so I was uh, the, the the way I first got involved in thinking about these economic issues was in uh, 2010. 
uh, at the, after the global financial crisis in 2010, the new coalition government came in. There was the sense that we needed austerity, that the government had to cut back spending. And there was a big worry that, uh, that, that you know, research and development would be part of that cutback. So the Royal Society did a very big piece of work uh, to, 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 demonstrate, to, to argue that science and technology were really important for, for, for economic growth. So that's the first place I got involved with it. I was on the, the steering committee for that. Uh, and I just want to stress how much economists don't understand what's going on. So every year, the, 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 uh, the, the Office of Budgetary Responsibility uh, produces a forecast for the UK economy. And every year, well, certainly every year between 2009 and 2016, they just, the economists just assumed this will just bounce back. So you've got this amazing graph of every year they put a far forecast in that's much too um, optimistic. And, it, it, you know, it just never really arrived. So, I, I, you know, this just stresses to me that it's kind of a paradox that, you know, we think it seems obvious that technological progress leads to economic growth. And it seems obvious that economists would think they understood that because, you know, that's the basis of all these kinds of, uh, of forecasts, but, but they really don't. And so there's still really a puzzle as to why this hasn't recovered. Uh, I worked um, in, so, so, so uh, I, I got um, the opportunity to, to, to think about this with, with, with some quite interesting and, and, and thoughtful people. So in uh, about 2016, I worked with Diane Coyle, who's a professor of, uh, she's a professor of public policy in Cambridge, she's in Cambridge too. Uh, Andy Westwood's a, 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 a um, Manchester colleague, a, 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 a kind of government practice expert. Craig Berry's a political scientist. Kate Barker is a, 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 an economist was on the Monetary Policy Committee, and then I was the scientist brought into this. And this is a fascinating process where I learned a huge amount about, not just about economics, but about politics and how that works. So uh, we, we, we wrote a report, and then we got to, to, uh, to, to present this. So uh, it was, you know, by having some serious people on there besides me, we, we got some hearing from the government and I think this, this report did then influence government policy that, that Greg Clark um, was then in charge of. So it did, so, so the government produced an industrial strategy, uh, which did have, you know, as a key policy, increasing R&D investment to 2.4%. I put this in, this is kind of, um, one of the things that you do if you get involved in policy, one of the ways in which you can influence policy is through, uh, commons select committees. So, so the House of Commons has, indeed the House of Lords, they have select committees which hold the government to account on different aspects of policy. And so uh, as a result of that, that document, I got invited to, uh, to, to give some evidence to a House of Commons select committee. So this is how it works. This is in, in, in Westminster in the Houses of Parliament, in one of the committee rooms. How it works. You have a chair at the end, a bunch of parliamentarians, MPs sitting around in, 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 in a circle, and then you can just see my balding head just to the left uh, there. Uh, why I titled this is because the woman in red on, on the top there. So I I write a blog. I've had a blog since about 2004, and I write things in this blog. And I'd written a piece. Uh, for my blog called What Has Science Policy Ever Done for Barnsley? And this happened because I was actually spending some time in Cambridge. This was a time when I was collaborating with Richard Friend and Akshay, getting so that project off the ground. And it kind of really struck me. So, I, you know, being in Sheffield at the time, Barnsley, for those who don't know, it's an old coal mining town, very, very poor, very, you know, quite depressed feeling. And, you know, in terms of its prosperity, you know, manifestly, it was, it's like, it is a different world. If you come from Barnsley and come to Cambridge, Cambridge is a prosperous, uh, knowledge-driven economy. Barnsley is, you know, a place where large numbers of people are unemployed. There's not really any real industry anymore because coal mining shut down. 
So I'd written this piece called What's Science Science Policy Ever Done for Barnsley to kind of highlight that contrast. And anyway, that lady up there called, said, oh, really like your blog piece called What's Science Policy Done from Barnsley because I'm the MP for Barnsley. What do you think it has done? And it kind of really made me think. Uh, and I think this, this problem has become even more marked, uh, you know, since um, you know, 2016, we had the Brexit vote. And it's very clear there's, you know, both in the UK, also in the USA, you know, that sense that we had a prosperous part of the country that was kind of very happy with the way things were, more or less. And then you have, you know, what people have come to turn left behind communities, which felt disconnected from the economy and, you know, quite bitter and quite uh, uh, willing to throw any kind of political spanner in the works they can do. Uh, so. Um, I re having done that, I, I thought about this a bit more, and I wrote a piece on my blog, uh, which is really about, okay, what, what could we do? What could we do to answer that question? What could we do to make people in Barnsley think that science and engineering and technology did something for their lives? And so it was about, you know, what, what could you do to, to, to build more innovation capacity across the whole UK? Uh, and I, as I say, I wrote it and I just put it on my blog. And then I got rung up. Day. I, was, uh, was, I was in my office about five o'clock one day in 2019. And I got a phone call from a guy. And he said, oh, I'm, I'm calling you from The Guardian. Um, I just wondered what your reaction was to the fact that Dominic Cummings has just kind of put a, a blog post praising your work. <laughs> and, uh, I thought, oh, that's very interesting. Anyway, that's clearly the, the angle that the Guardian took on the whole uh, the, the whole business. But you know, it was a very interesting experience because it did Cummings. Then, when Cummings, uh, when when the twenty twenty government came in, Cummings invited me to number ten, and I got to talk to him about what I thought that we ought to do about science, and that was very interesting. And I suppose this then I I, I then thought about okay. That, that part of this is about where R&D is done. Obviously, a lot of R&D is done in Cambridge. The point we'd make, actually, was that loads of R&D is done in Cambridge. So the public sector, I mean, if you're an economist, what you will say is that the private sector, if you just left research to the private sector, it would never do enough research because a company can't keep hold of the results of its research. So if a company just does research by itself, it's inevitable that the, the results of that our research will leak out. Other companies will copy its products. It won't capture the benefit. So that's a classical economist argument about why uh, if you leave research, the private sector, you won't get enough done to benefit society at large. And that's the fundamental argument why economists, even the most kind of free market economists will say it's worth supporting public sector research, because uh, otherwise it wouldn't get done and it drives the wider economy. And in print, you know, it drives the wider economy in the sense that, um, you know, it's obvious Cambridge is a booming town in many ways. And it's booming because the private sector comes here to take advantage of the research that's done in the university, in the public sector. It, it benefits from all the smart people who are here who can then go and work for those places. And that's the way that you get this positive virtuous circle. You get a, a lot of public sector research and then that drives a lot of private sector research and that, that produces new products, economic growth and all that kind of thing. But the UK has this characteristic, it's a strange characteristic, that although I, and I, I'm happy to single out Cambridge because Cambridge genuinely comes out of statistics looking very good on this measure. But other parts of the country, quite a lot of public sector R&D happens, but there's not very much private sector R&D. So you think, oh, why are we doing that? Other parts of the country have lots of private sector R&D, but then there's not a lot of public sector R&D. And you think, well, there must be opportunities that are being missed here. So this is an analysis that we did about uh, how the, the, the UK government should, should spend money in, uh, in other places. Uh, really pointed out, this is the, the, the kind of crucial plot, that R&D spending is very, very concentrated in London, the East and the South East. So in a sense, the answer to the question is, you know, what science policy ever done for Barnsley? Well, it's hardly done anything for Barnsley at all because Barnsley is down 
South Yorkshire, just to the left of the Lanks. There's virtually very, very little research of any kind, public or private, is done there. Uh, so you have this weird thing that public sector funding is more concentrated than private sector funding. And actually, you have this huge concentration in London, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, and then that's completely correlated with the regional uh, uh, discrepancies in economic performance. So the UK is a very unusual country. It's genuinely two countries. So this map here just shows GDP per capita. And um, the bottom right of the UK is the, we've got a blue bit for London, green bits for the southeast and, and the east. You know, they look like a, a, a northern European economy, very comparable with uh, the, 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 the low countries, the, the uh, West Germany, as was Switzerland, northern Italy. But, you know, you get look at Wales, the northeast. Wales and the northeast economically have the performance of Portugal. Uh, and this is a kind of weird and odd thing. So the government did respond to this. So the government produced a, 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 an R&D roadmap, which uh, uh, talked about levelling up R&D in the UK. It had an advisory group. They asked me to be on it. And then that was uh, turned into the levelling up white paper, which increased. So there's a, a lot of science spending, increased science spending was promised in autumn 2021. And the level, levelling up white paper committed to, 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 to increasing R&D spending outside the Greater Southeast by a third. Uh, it had a specific um, uh, recommendation about, uh, about city regions, which I was involved with. So this gave me the opportunity. So, so I now work with Greater Manchester with the combined authority to try and, try and work out how can we use R&D to benefit not just the centre of Greater Manchester, which you know has its own, which is quite feels quite prosperous, but you know the Manchester equivalent to Barnsley, a place like Oldham, Rochdale, Bury, very very poor, deindustrialised uh, 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 parts that have never recovered from the big recessions in the eighties. So that's what uh, I um, I'm currently in, in in the process of of working on. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to thank. Lots of people have helped me in all this stuff. I mean, I've mentioned many of the graduate students, postdocs, collaborators, people who have funded me from research councils and industry. I would like to say it's been a lot of fun to work with, you know, science and technology studies, innovation studies, economics. These are interesting, serious academic disciplines. And it's been, you know, I've learned so much from people in those fields. It's been great fun to work across the fields like that. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to finish with that. That's a picture of. My, uh, my, my chef, that was actually my leaving walk from Sheffield. So that's the moors above, uh, very close to my house, just about 10 miles um, uh, east of Sheffield. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. It's very interesting. So now we will open up to questions to anyone about the uh, if anyone has questions about the talk. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh. Hi, thank you so much. Um, in the previous talk, we've discussed um, that in the UK, there can be a sense that um, we're very good at uh, getting small startups and yep. a lot of uh, high quality universities. Yep. And that they then leave um, for better industrial climates uh, yep. to the s Germany, et cetera. Um, do you see that there's a problem as well? And if so, what do you think we should do about it? Yeah, I think it's absolutely a problem. I think uh, you know you see that in um, you know many many companies that you know I think of specific companies that are left Cambridge. Selexa left Cambridge, fantastic, uh, important company that was bought by Illumina, the major driving force of genome sequencing, invented in this very department. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it is a problem. I mean, I think uh, the, 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 the two things I think one should try and do about it, I think we do need to spend more money on translational research facilities, as it were. So, so places like, you know, Germany has the Fraunhofer Institute, which are kind of, you know, so, somehow situated between universities and industry, and they're kind of really good at bridging that gap really good at doing more translational research. So I think there's a kind of institutional issue about having more, um, more of uh, more research um, 
at uh, that translational end. In the UK, we have these things called catapult centres, which kind of sort of fit that, but they're not big enough. There's not enough of them and they're not enough in enough subjects. Uh, so that's one problem. And then I think the other problem is about finance, uh, that, that um, you know, our financial system doesn't seem to be geared up to, um, uh, to, to, to scale up funding. And uh, I mean, there are various reforms going on at the moment about, you know, um, changing the laws for, for, for what pension funds need to do, which may have some impact on that. But there's probably some cultural changes needed about what people think are safe investments. So, yeah, I think it's a big problem. I can hear you. Um, if you were to show the movie with Raquel Welch, yeah. what would be the plot? So it shows nanotechnology afterwards. Uh, sorry, which bit of the movie shows now technology accurately? No, what uh, is supposed to be your movie? That oh, I see. If I if I was going to have an actual realistic, no, I, I mean it's a really interesting question because I think the environment looks very different. You know, that if you're in this, if you're in this submarine, it would be shaking around all over the place because it would have, you know, it would be subject to huge Brownian motion. It would be doing all kinds of, you know, it'll be wobbling internally because all its internal modes, you know, every, um, every, every possible mode of vibration has half a kT of energy thanks to uh, equipartition. So it would be wobbling and shaking and jiggling around all the time. Uh, it would probably have things stuck to it left, right and centre because, you know, those strong surface forces would be happening. So I think in terms of the visuals, that's what it would look like. You know, and that is actually, you know, that actually is what biology looks like. And, and we're kind of, you know, we're getting more understanding of that because single molecule biophysics is, you know, allowing us to visualize that environment and measure that environment and see what it's like. So that's my answer. Sorry, it's not really a help in terms of what the plot's going to be, but uh, that would be what the, the, the that would be what the you know that would what it would feel like. I think it would just feel like you've been shaken up all the time and fle flexing around. Yes. Thank you for the talk. <clears throat> I'm quite curious about the cathode-driven nanoparticle. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how is it possible to use that mechanism to um, inject a nanobot into our blood vessel for medical reasons? Because it would be it sounds quite dangerous to like let chemical reaction happen in our blood vessels. Yeah. No. I. I, I mean. Yeah. I. I mean. That's the sort of thing and that there's been a huge amount of work in that area since our first paper on it. And I'm sure every paper starts by saying, oh, this could be a way of propelling medicines. Of course, that's very difficult for two reasons. One is, you know, what chemical reaction would you use? But you could use, I mean, you could imagine using sugar. I mean, you could, could imagine using an enzyme which, um, which, which reacts with glucose. So uh, horseradish peroxidase is everybody's favorite uh, uh, enzyme for eating glucose. So you could think of a kind of biocompatible reaction. What's actually slightly more tricky is thinking, out how do you actually steer it? Because the thing is itself doing brown, you know, and I didn't, the, the video didn't show, go on for long enough, but what, what actually, what you find is that there's a very nice crossover because the, 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 the thing itself is rotating. So the direction of propulsion is changing randomly. So actually, in long time, what you see is actually a particle that's still doing diffusion. It's still randomly moving. But the effective diffusion coefficient is much bigger than the natural diffusion would be. So in a sense, the first thing you would do would be just you would just effectively increase the diffusion coefficient and increase the, the, the way it moves around. I mean, we, people have spent some time thinking about, you know, could you steer it using external fields, for example, external electrical and magnetic fields? Uh, could you, I mean, the, the, the biological analog, so, so a, um, a bacteria, bacteria kind of operate this way too, in a sense. And they, what bacteria work out how to do is that they, they, they can swim up a concentration gradient. So they can detect a concentration gradient. So if it's a concentration gradient of some food molecule, they can swim towards the source of the food or they can swim away from something that's repelling them. So this is what's called chemotaxis. Uh, and so there are various 
schemes for, 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 for mimicking chemo taxes. And so that would be another way that you could do it. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's a pipe dream about how you would make it useful, but quite a lot of people are thinking about it. Yeah, regarding like leveling up R and D uh, investments across the UK, uh, obviously it helps with like solving problems of regional inequality. But is there any like economic or other reasons that distributing the investment more evenly across countries would help research in general, other than kind of concentrate them in some some area? I think I, I mean it's an interesting question. I, I mean I think you know there are benefits of concentration because you know it uh, and the, the benefit of a very research intensive um city like cambridge is you know you just have loads of people all working on different aspects of different problems who can all bump into each other and enrich the uh the, enrich that environment so i think that there are benefits in concentration, but I think that there's also benefits in diversity. And I think you know having places that have different specialisms, for example, is is, is potentially important. And I also think what, what one thing I think is important is connecting things to manufacturing more. So, you know, in high technology manufacturing, there is a lot of you know, what economists call tacit knowledge, you know, lots of, you know, you ask the question, you know, why is TSMC able to make integrated circuits better than anybody else? It's not just because they've got huge, you, you know, they have marvellous equipment, but it's the same equipment that everybody else has got, it's the same equipment that Intel has got, but there's just a whole bunch of tacit knowledge that is concentrated, you know, in the heads of their engineers about how you do this. And that tacit knowledge, I think, is enriched by research. And I think, you know, TSMC is a really interesting example because uh, the history of TSMC is that there's a, a, a research institute in Sinshu called, um, called ITRI, Industrial Technology Research Institute. And TSMC was actually a spin out from ITRI, which was actually produced where the focus is not actually on developing fundamentally new technology so they the the the, um, the technology the development was you know the basic CMOS process in fact in fact I think they licensed it from RCA and then but then there was a whole lot of detailed uh, innovation process innovation that probably you know it probably didn't lead to well it certainly didn't lead to loads of high, highly cited papers because it was all about generating knowledge that was used inside the company to really drive that manufacturing process to the amazing uh, perfection that it sees together today so i think there's an argument and again this actually also is connected to this question about why we can't scale up because those scaling up issues are about how do you how do you make a manufacturing process really work you know, and there aren't that, that many companies in the UK that are that great at doing something. I mean, Rolls Royce is very good at making jet engines, and that's you know that that the, the, those you know there's amazing things happening in there. You've got turbine blades that are basically operating at temperatures that are about two hundred degrees above the melting temperature of the alloy, and there, there's huge amounts of really cool material science in making these turbine blades. They're all single crystals, so they don't creep. There's they're, 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 they're they're um, engineered so that they are, you know, they, that they can be kept cool. You know, and that's the kind of translational research that is less well done in, in a university. It's probably better done either in a company or in a kind of translational research facility. You know, likewise, I mean, there's a place called IMEC in Belgium, which is very much associated with ASML. So AS, as ASML was developing DPV lithography, you know, lots of that research was driven quite, trans, you know, it's quite translational. It's not fundamental science, but it's really important. And that's how you kind of convert things into products that work. So um, just a question, like, would you think the public research or uh, what private research is more of the limiting factor in the UK? Uh, I think it's it's a bit of both, actually. I mean, I think, to be honest, you get what you deserve. I mean, there's a, there's a rough rule of thumb that says, that, that works across quite a lot of countries, 
that if you put one pound of public research and you get two pounds of private research, that works for kind of European countries and the USA. Uh, East Asian countries tend to have a higher private sector amount. That, that, so, so Korea has a much higher ratio of private sector to, to, to public sector. Uh, but the UK, I think, just doesn't have enough of either, basically. It's as simple as that. If we had more public research, we'd have more private research. You know, having fixed some of those issues about how companies scale and what the access to finance is. So I think it's actually both. One of the prospects of organic research is that it kind of like it pays to the companies, as you said. Yeah. Well, I, as I say, I, I don't think they will. And I think, you know, so, so Akshay's uh, company is focusing on, you know, essentially using organic materials as an add-on to silicon. So you put the so you put the organic material on top of a silicon cell cell to make the silicon cell more efficient. And the same is true. I mean, if you know Henry Snaith's uh, in Oxford, well, Henry Snaith was a, another Richard Friend PhD student, but you know, in Oxford, he he developed this, the perovskite um, cell cells, and his company is focusing on essentially tandem solar cells you've got a perovskite layer and then a silicon layer so i think you know silicon is a really entrenched technology it would be really difficult to displace it but but you know the the hope would be that you could make it better okay. if no one has any questions i think we're going to kind of